So I won't um, provide a fulsome bio of Howard because he can do it much better than I can. As I said, he's uh, been both a counselor and a band administrator for Musqueam Indian Band, has many more um, professional career stories to tell, as well as personal um, of, of his experience in his own community, which I know are, are equally, if not more important to him. So with that, I will turn it over to Howard. Thanks, Howard. Thank you, Jahan. <clears throat> and um, just to let everyone know that I'm just coming off of COVID. So if I start waning a bit and start coughing, you'll know why I'm COVID free now, but still suffering the after effects. So um, first and foremost, I wanna say thank you to First Nation Public Service for uh, doing these fireside chants. Secondly, I wanna say a real, Thank you to all of you who decided that you wanted to join and listen into this conversation. Um, it's always a challenge for me and, and most Native people in general, because humility, respect, pride is probably the most fundamental thing in our culture, you know. We never brag about ourselves. We, you know, and and uh, and and still today, I find it hard. Even though I've been around the block a couple of times, that um, you always you always wonder as to say, well, what did what did I do that was meaningful in life and for our people? So uh, I'm apologizing in advance because um, I, I I always find it a bit embarrassing i guess is you know to say i i did nothing on my own you know i had family i had relatives and together we achieved things so i'll start there and i just want to say to um rachel uh rachel bob uh from snonois uh my name is kayapalano i'm kayapalano the seventh and the origin of the name Kayapalana comes from your territory in Snanawas. My, my great, 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 great grandfather married uh, your princess over in that territory. And part of the ceremony was that the leader of that community said, if you, if you are to take my daughter's hand, that you must return with the firstborn son and we will name him. So Kayapalano the first was named, and it was his son that met Captain Vancouver in 1792. So I am a direct line, even though there are a number of Kayapalanos throughout our territory, the one that made it famous was Kayapalano the Great. He was the great warrior and whatnot. So, uh, and I come from that direct line. You know, we have Kayapalano in in Macaw Nation, we have one in in uh, Cooper Island, I believe, and one down in um, in uh, around Mill Bay area, and one in Lummi. So I use that, but those are different families. Those those don't belong to this family that I speak of, although we are distantly distantly related. And to uh, Amanda from Lytton. Um, I don't know if Ruby Dunstan is still a, a, alive and well, but if she is, can you reach out to her and tell her Howard said hi? And uh, because I was district manager for a large number of years in, in that area of Kamloops, Lytton, and uh, in, in the Fraser Canyon area. So uh, it's nice to have uh, acquaintances. And Mike from Quiquitlam, <laughs> I spent many, many a day as a young boy in Quiquitlam with my mother going to visit uh, our family there. And uh, at that particular time, uh, Tommy Williams, or we, as we knew him as One-Eyed Tommy, was a man that was still alive who used to venture into Musqueam to go to our longhouse and uh, during the winter ceremony, spirit dancing, because he was a spirit dancer. And that was the only place that he could come to, to 
to perform and, 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 and do his uh, spiritual ceremonies. So welcome and, and thank you for being on this call. So I just give you a little bit of history to that, that uh, to, before I embark upon my life journey, you know, and to, to say that um, I've had intimate relations with, with your people yesterday and today. So having said all those kinds of things now that, um, just to give you a little bit of personal history about me, Howard Grant, you know, again, as I said, my name is Paya Palano. Uh, I was bestowed this name. Um, I, would, I did not choose it. Uh, there was another name I really wanted, but, but <laughs> you're not allowed to choose your own name. So they said, no, Howard, you're the, you're the person that epitomizes the characteristics, the values and principles of that man and his, uh, his previous ancestors. So all of my elders in my community came together and said, you will take this name. So I also carry a second name. It's apparently a, a huge name up in, uh, in, in Namgis territory, Pakwakua people. My name is Wallace Graham. Wallace Graham in translates to big whale, big, big name, big fish, big names. So that's who I am. And growing up as a young boy, I, I thought we were an independent people. You know, even though we abutted the largest city in Western Canada called Vancouver, no one knew that there was an Indian reservation here. If somebody were to ask uh, 15 blocks away from here to say, where's the closest Indian reserve? They would say Squamish, which was 15 miles on the North shore, 10 miles away from us. And we liked it that way because we remain totally independent and invisible. But I have to say, sadly, that's been our Achilles heel as well, because as we move towards uh, shared territory and overlap, you know, those who speak to the, the anthropologists and archeologists and whatever else, those become a written document that although never authenticated nor validated is accepted in the courtrooms. So it presents a huge challenge in regards to what is the real history of the province of British Columbia and of our territory. And I'm sure this happens into every First Nations community, you know, because in 1792, when the first white man arrived, it wasn't long thereafter. And you take fast forward by 10 years, every area that had a fort that you had mass migration of Europeans and First Nations individuals who came from territories that may not have had resources because they came to sell and, and work uh, the various uh, loading the ships, et cetera. So they, they became what you call hang around the Fort Indians that, and, and then reserves were created around there for those individuals, even though they weren't from that territory. So, you have a number, if you look at the maps, you'll see a lot of Indian reserves close by uh, various fort settings, Victoria, Nanaimo, Prince, uh, Prince George, et cetera. So, and likewise here in my community, but growing up as a young boy uh, in the 1940s, we were the only nation that I know of in North America that still had their five long houses with their fires still burning bright. You know, I, I was fortunate enough not to have to go to residential school, you know, because I, I was uh, part Chinese as well. So, so all of my cousins went to residential school, but then I became a captive audience in my community. That is to say, I became the surrogate son, nephew, grandson of all of our older people that were remain behind in our community. I must say to let you know that uh, carbon dating, we were noted to be here for over 4,000 years in this particular settlement area and 9,000 years upriver as the Delta was being formed. But when you look at the 4,000 year term and, and beyond, they, there's a place called Sesnam at the foot of Granville, 
and uh, 70th Avenue, which is close to the airport. And there they believe that there was over 25,000 Musqueam people resident in that area. But as I said, when I came to my census in the 1940s, we were approximately 200, the result of the Spanish flu and smallpox decimated our communities and not just ours, but everyone else's in British Columbia. But I was lucky enough to have people who were in the ages of 80, 90, and a few in their hundreds. So in the winter, I lived in the longhouse and watched ceremony, heard stories, heard history. And by day, I went to public school. And I was very blessed. <laughs> I, I live on the upper middle class west side. So here I am, a poor Indian boy, uh, going to public school with kids that had shiny bikes and whatever else. But uh, did I lack confidence? No, because growing up as a young child, they told me who I was, who I came from, or where I came from, to give me the confidence of going forward and being proud and respectful of knowing who I am and who my family were and are. So I moved fast forward to going to high school and then graduating. My first year of university in 1965, believe it or not, in Greater in Vancouver, um, I had to study under kerosene lamp. And uh, my house that I lived in, my mother's house, had uh, no insulation that you could see the nails uh, from the outdoor shiplap and the uh, tar paper, etc. Uh, no running water. We had to pack water approximately a block and a half away. And, and, and an outhouse, you know, there again, I was not embarrassed. I was proud because I knew who I was. But those were my early beginnings. I was a fisherman. Uh, I did, I was a fisherman most of my life in my early life. At uh, Musqueam was always proud to say that we had high line fishermen. So, uh, those of us that became fishermen were, were, were mentored and taught by our, our, our elders. And then I went long shoring and I was a construction worker. But I moved fast forward to the 1970s now. And Musqueam started, they hired a band manager. We were either the first or the first of five, I guess, to hire an administrative individual to work at their band in the early 70s. And basically their functions was something very simple. That simple function was to go down to Indian Affairs downtown, pick up the welfare checks and education checks, come back and redistribute them to the band members who were uh, identified in those checks. <laughs> and then we move forward again ever so slightly and taking on more delegated clerical responsibilities within uh, the government operations welfare, education, et cetera, but again, still at the clerical level. At that particular time, we as native people did a, a service and yet a, a disservice to our people because we were trying to create employment on reserve as well. So what happened was rather than take that CR3 level salary and give it to one individual, we split it and made two jobs. You know, so again, it was, it was something that uh, people got to enjoy, but at the same time, we were doing a disservice to the individuals who were having to fulfill those responsibilities. You know. So, but rumblings underneath our political people were engaged in, and in particular, at that particular time, every Indian chief that went to Indian Affairs, they would tell them a different story. So basically we're not fighting amongst ourselves, but having a, ch a challenge to get what we wanted and needed. So a coalition of political individuals from my community, Chief Delbert Guerin from Musqueam, Chief Joe Mathias from Squamish, Chief Teddy Dixon and Clarence Joe from Seashell. The genesis of taxation, the genesis of land management and the genesis of self-government was born. 
A couple of years later in the 70s, Kamloops and West Bank decided to join this coalition. And as a result of that, Kamloops took on taxation because they were a single jurisdiction. West, West Bank took on land management because they too were a single jurisdiction and Seashell took on self-government. So, and all three now are, I would consider successes uh, in comparison to the rest of the First Nations in British Columbia. So you look at those kinds of things and you say, it's amazing that British Columbia through great leadership throughout and we ask the question, how and why? The answer is fairly simple. One, 1792, the first white man arrives on the West. 1492, the first white man arrives on the East. So a 300 year difference. And by the time British Columbia now started to become a participant, not just in confederation, but in the, in the, in the development of Canada, our native people still had, our older people back in the 70s, still had strong remnant of um, understanding of our self-governance and our laws. We were proud, we were successful, and that allowed our, our, our leaders and then our young leaders that followed to to create a number of significant changes in, in the national scene. You know, again, you look at Musqueam in, in a sense of the Garen decision, the fiduciary responsibility led by Chief Delbert Garen and Councillor Joe Becker of that day, you know, to tell you the story that the intimate uh, story was the fact that Councillor Joe Becker made the motion in council chambers to say, we have to go to court. But before they did that, they went to the community and said, we were wronged and here's how and why, and we come to you. But we must inform you that if we are to lose, that we will have to tighten our belts for 10 years. So bar none, our elders stood up, followed by the younger members of our population to say, we were wrong, we have to fight. And I must say, it, and I applaud my leadership and my people of that day, because never did they reach out to other First Nations and say, we're going to court, can you help us? We were proud and we said, we will do it on our own. And then in the 1980s, the issue of fishing rights came up to be. And then the court case for the Sparrow decision was made. I was a key witness on that particular court case. As a matter of fact, I was probably the key witness. And at the end of the, lo and behold, when the final judgment came out, I was on the other side, on the First Nations side, leading the charge along with Bud Sparrow and company. But when the, when the decision came down, I was a senior bureaucrat. So I got to see the legal responses from both sides as to say, what was the outcome of that? From the First Nations legal team, they said, we got A to, to X. And uh, from the federal government side, it was only A to P. So the huge difference in regards to analysis and realities. And that, that stood very strongly in my mind to say, okay, we can do all the damn work that we want in regards to developing legislation, policy, et cetera, et cetera. And we will define it in our own minds. But when it goes internally, it will be different. You know, I was part and parcel of tribal council funding formula and the band support funding formula. And most importantly, at that particular time, the AFA alternative funding, i.e. block funding. When I went in and I was seconded to headquarters, I ended up having to, I, I stand up and I, and I give a presentation and I say, I gave birth to a, a black haired, brown eyed, brown skinned baby. I had to come home, but the baby stayed in the hospital because it had jaundice. 
i.e. it had to go into central, central agency areas and then get refined. Then the baby came home. When I picked up that baby, it was blonde, blue eyed. So that tells you the, the challenges that we have. But I'll step back for a moment. And I became the band manager of my First Nation back in 1981. And I was there for five years. And then I, I chose to, to uh, seek a position within the federal civil service, i.e. Indian and Northern Affairs. The young politicians of that day, I won't mention names, all you have to do is look and say, okay, who was a young politician in the 80s? That they all said to me, Howard, you're the last person we ever thought that would ever become a bureaucrat and work on the other side. And I responded to them, looking them straight in the eye, and I said, you know, every one of you young whippersnappers and every one of your past leaders have said, we want an interdependent relationship. We will always have that relationship with the crown. And I understood that. And I said, in order to have a true, true relationship with the crown, you better understand the machinery of government. Because if you don't, then that's not a true relationship. So that's why I embarked upon a career in the federal public service as a senior manager. It allowed me to enter into the intimate intimacies of, of the bowels of, of government, to learn the processes, uh, the, the uh, barriers, the, uh, the subtle nuances and major nuances. And, and the how to. So, and that's the sad reality is that many of our First Nation leaders have not had that opportunity, nor do they understand the other side. And likewise, with a lot of our administrative, senior administrative people, they've never had the luxury. You know, they understand program and services, they understand formula funding but they don't understand how the makeup of the machinery of government uh, translates into uh, the reality of providing those resources necessary for uh, us to survive. So I look at those kinds of things and I say, how do we address them? You know, I was there as a bureaucrat during OCA, I was there, and as I said, when the, the, the findings came out on Sparrow, and their internal communication differed very dramatically from what you and I would hear on the, on, on the street level. So it's, it's quite interesting to, to see that, that diff those differences. And I asked, I asked the bureaucrat and I asked First Nations. I asked First Nations administrators and I asked First Nation chiefs and counselors. Do you know the Indian Act? Do you understand the Indian Act? You know, we all know the atrocities of residential school, the 60s scoop. And, but do we know what the program and services? We all complain, you know, about the 55 cent dollar to deliver a program. You know, but what are the solutions to that? And that is where we have to look at and understand the machinery of government. We have to look at what was the, the underlying things that, that really, really fundamentally changed the course of First Nation. The loss of our women, our historians, our language keepers, and, you know, by them having to marry somebody and from another reserve and have to relocate, or if they married a non-Indigenous person, they had to leave the reserve. That was our history, our history books and, our, and whatnot leaving us. That's a significant, significant det detriment to, to, to us in regards to who we are, where we come from. And then as well too, 
that we in British Columbia as native people were capitalists, not under the definition of the white man. Our capitalism was that we accumulated wealth, but we, re, we redistributed that wealth in a shared basis. And our definition of share is different than the white man's definition. So you look at that, and then when they placed the Indian Act upon us, they moved us into a prisoner of war camp environment, i.e. called Indian Reserves. And then they, set, they imposed a socialist mentality and value system into our community. That is to say, every dollar that came into our community was to be equally redistributed amongst the population. That created a disincentive for economic survivability that made them enhanced dependent upon uh, the great white father or whomever. So those are clear, clear fundamental uh, items that are not talked about nor re fully realized in regards to how these things have affected us over the short period of time. Today, you hear people saying, we got to get rid of the Indian Act, you know, and then you look at East of the Rockies and they're totally against getting rid of the Indian Act because their treaty, their number of treaties, although very vague, give life, the Indian Act gives it a little bit of life. So they will never give up the Indian Act. Tax exemption, likewise, they'll never give it up. Yeah. And then if you look at what we have done around the country, what is the Indian Act about? People, okay? But many First Nations now have legislated that they'll take on membership. They will take on elections. The only thing that's left about the people is the wills and estates that are still run by Indian Affairs. Land, many First Nations now have land management, delegated authority. So no longer within the Indian Act. Tax, you know, we do a lot of taxing and property, et cetera. ECDEV, you know, we have to be very concerned, especially for uh, on reserve, you know, for non-renewable and renewable resources. Non-renewable, <clears throat> as an example, Hobima, multi, multi, multi-millionaire rich, is now running out of oil. They're going to be bound to poverty in 50 years. Non no more non-renewable resource. The land is now another 100 years from, from coming, Mother Earth coming back and building itself up. So non-renewable resources, you have to be careful. And renewable resources, if you cut every timber down in the first 10 years, it's going to take another 50 plus years to cut your second timber. So you have to be mindful of the fact of predictability, sustainability, and sufficiency. When we look at UNDRIP and the 94 calls to action, there's only one item in 94 calls to action that, that, that identifies economic development. Yet that is probably one of the most critical, critical areas in regards to us maintaining uh, independence and survivability. All of the other ones are, 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 are important, they're relevant, they're, they're social issues, but only one item on ECDEV. Within UNDRIP and, and DRIPA, you know, we all recognize the fundamental bottom line point. There is an inescapable economic component that is required in regards to uh, the full realization of DRIPA and UNDRIP. You know, and when you look at these kinds of things, are we making advancement? Do we understand? And again, as I said, do we understand the machinery of government? And let me use one example that you may all be aware of. We had a team that negotiated gaming revenue, which was never ever distributed to First Nations, or so we think. But if you look at 
10 years prior to the actual gaming legislation, those gaming revenues were placed into a um, aggregated pot and, and allocated to out. <clears throat> now we move forward and we say, we got that legislation, we got gaming, but do we? I ask you that question, do we have gaming? Because the gaming revenue that is received and it's a fluctuating amount, it's not a reality, it's not predictable, that there are strings attached to that. That is to say, here, you will get 100,000 or a quarter of a million from gaming, but you can only spend it on A, B, C, D, and E, and you cannot expend it on X, Y, and Z. That is not a win. That is just another government trans program transfer payment, period. So that's why I asked, do you fully understand the machinery of government? We know program and services very, very, very well. We do a good job at it. You know, We make the best use of the limited amount of resources that are there. But tomorrow, we all want governance. And every First Nation that I know of that uh, is in this, either in treaty or if they're not in treaty, they're, they're negotiating some form of self-government and or other constructive agreements, which are, again, from a baptismal perspective, first steps on treaty. It's all treaty. And governance is a critical component because if you look at every First Nation, including those that are OSR rich, they have a good public admin to deliver program and services, but we have zero capacity to deliver good governance. We, we don't have a judiciary. We don't have a legal and um, other uh, items on the uh, on that bylaw making, because we all, we all, we'll all create bylaws, but we have no implementation. We have no enforcement to be able to, to put it to life. Our economies and economics and governance, you know, because we have none, you know, like, are we reliant upon a, a small revenue stream? And our operational, our corporate services, you know, those that are institutions in support of good governance, do we have them? And if we don't, do we have other institutions that can support it? The First Nations Summit created what you would call the First Nations Education Steering Committee that will help First Nations in regards to their development of schools and, and funding, et cetera. They also created the Aboriginal Financial Officers Association, which now is parachuted into a national body. And then as well too, they, they had the First Nations Health Authority was created there, starting off with the First Nations Health Committee, and then, then moved into the Health Authority created by the summit. And then as well, that you have a number of these other in institutions that are there. Financial Management Board incubated at the First Nations Summit. And, and now we have the First Nations Public Service, which we're hoping will be able to launch into becoming their own independent body. But these are institutions that I would see as supporting all First Nations in British Columbia, because we all need that. I just finished a conversation with uh, ITAB, Land Management, FMB, and I asked them, why isn't there a continued rise and take up? Because communication is not there. Information is not there. If you don't know about it and you don't know the good things and what it can do for you, that you, don't, you, will, not, you will not seek it out. So... Those are the kinds of things that we need to look at in regards to how we would improve ourselves. So I give you, I give you a snapshot of Howard Grant in, in regards to my mindset that I would like to not so much close by saying 
Um, I have always been a firm believer of a political agenda and that we have a strong administrative support to fulfill and, and be a supporter of our champions. Okay. I've often been times been asked to run and, and become the chief of my community. I've always chosen not to simply because I know I can do a better job helping the chief achieve something that's the best for my community. So I chose that path as opposed to one that sits out in front and, and, um, and leads the people. I rather lead from behind and, and, and uh, be invisible. But I, I look at those kinds of things and, and then I say to myself, how and why? I have to say that my, my strength, my commitment, and my love for what I'm doing comes from the fact that I grew up in my longhouse. I grew up mentored by my old people. I grew up watching my local governance and laws being practiced on a daily basis prior to the full uh, entrenchment by Indian Act. And I still believe today that, that we, we don't assert <laughs> we actually practice and, and do, you know, Sparrow is a good example, Garen is a good example, and all of our economic opportunities that we've created are good examples of not, not waiting, not waiting for an entrepreneur or a carpetbagger to come to our door and say, have I got a deal for you? We've had those kinds of people, but we, we know what we want, we know what we need, and we know what what we have to have for our future.